I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode. This week I'm delighted to speak to Robert Goulster, one of the co-founders of Safe Soil UK, about soil testing. I started working on a new project last year and it transpired that the previous owner of the site may have been spreading coal ash over the land and that it was hoped we could grow some edibles on the site. Common sense dictates that coal ash is probably not something you want in your soil and so I endeavoured to get the soil tested. This is not an easy process. There are many companies offering soil testing but the whole process is incredibly opaque. Companies offering the testing often don't tell you what to test for or offer to explain the results they'll be sending and the process can be very costly. Enter SoilSafe UK, who offer soil tests for gardeners that make sense and don't cost a small fortune. Since reading around the subject, I'm really convinced we should be testing our soils a lot more often, so I think it's an important interview about a serious topic. I started by asking Robert what a soil test usually involves. Well, it's a simple question, and I suppose there is a, there's a variety of things that it can involve. At its most basic, I suppose a, a soil test is nothing more complicated than picking up a, a cheap pH meter somewhere, sticking it in your soil, and, um, and seeing what the pH reading is. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, when we, when we want to look for more detailed, when we want to have a more detailed look into what's in our soil, um, we almost certainly have to involve the lab to do some, some testing for us. Now, this, uh, this, this can be complicated, but it doesn't have to be. Um, it, it depends very much. The, the containers we use and, and the, the sorts of things you need to be aware of are fairly straightforward. Uh, when it comes to chemical testing, we, we, we need to use um, amber glass, for example. We can use plastic for basic pH. Um, all of these things, uh, once you take all of these things into consideration, you package up your sample, you send it off to a lab, and um, it will spit out the results. The, the problem is that Whatever those results may be, the, the sort of task only begins then because the, the, there is a matter of interpretation that comes into it. So at its most basic, if we're, if we're, if we're looking at uh, the fertility of soil, we test for basic, um, basic uh, elements that are, that our plants need to thrive. We look at the pH. We, of course, it can, it can affect how, how easily those, those plants can use those. And then we look at organic matter and, and, and those other nutrients that are there. On the other side of things, when it comes to chemical testing, this is this is much more complicated. The variety of things we can look for is, is the, the number of things we can look for rather is, is as long as my arm. Um, we tend to focus on on, on sort of uh, nasty things like heavy metals, lead, uh, cadmium, um, chromium, a variety of hydrocarbons, um, and even asbestos, which um, in urban areas can be found in, in some soil samples, usually as a result of um, demolition projects that have taken place uh, in the vicinity where some of the some of the asbestos was spread around and, and left hanging around in the air and then in the soil. So um, just to wrap up the question, I guess um, it can be as, as easy or as complicated as, as you want it to be, depending on what your circumstance may be. And would you need to provide the same sample for each of these tests? It very much depends on what you're what you're what you're testing for. So when we send out sample kits, we we often have a plastic bag because a, a, a simple clear plastic bag is, is is absolutely fine if you're testing fertility. But when it comes for chemical testing, you need an amber jar. You need to limit the amount of air in the jar so that the sample isn't um, isn't spoiled, and that when the lab gets the sample, it can it can do a, it can run a test um, without the sample having been compromised. So it very much um, it very much depends on what you're what you're testing for. Is there a difference between two tests at a kind of a domestic scale or testing on a on a larger scale, or are the principles the same? The principles are the same. Um, the, the 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 only thing one one needs to to keep in mind is that we we, we suggest that people take a um, a representative sample, which is which is taking little bits of uh, bits of soil from various various parts of their growing space and from various depths, mixing it all into one. And producing this representative sample, um, this this will give you a, this works fairly well for fairly small growing places. If you if you have a much larger plot, you may want to subdivide so that you don't get a um, you don't get a misleading reading. So if you mix up um, soil from from a variety of areas over over a huge space, 
uh, you can you can diminish the results um, and and sort of miss the point of it. Also, you may have to subdivide into smaller spaces. But the point is that an, an, a normal um, a normal a, an average home garden is it is going to be fine to to, to take it would be fine to take a representative sample from from, from that. Um, if on the chemical side, some 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 nasty contamination um, comes up in the in the, te in the results. It may be worthwhile trying to uh, drill down and find out exactly where it is. But in the first instance, just the, the the one the one overall sample should be fine. We're looking really to to set our minds at ease that everything is fine. So the expectation is that that hopefully the results come back negative. If they come back positive, then of course we we have to keep going and we'll, we'll drill down and then perhaps do some follow up testing. Um, uh, and 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 talk about some potential remediation strategies. It was interesting what you said about the asbestos, um, mm -hmm. because I think most people think if there was contaminants in the soil, they might come from uh, things that were incorporated into the soil or kind of naturally occurred there. Or um, I think maybe the, the thought of airborne things contaminating the soil is, is quite a novel one, maybe to some people. Um, but in what circumstances might you commission a soil test? Why might you need one or think you needed one? Well, um, people people choose to to test their soil for 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 you know any number of reasons. Um, as I said before, the most basic thing is a is a fertility test to, to check um, things like your like your pH level, whether your soil, soil is acidic or alkaline, um, organic matter content, texture, uh, as well as you know levels of major soil nutrients um, that that are available for your plants to to, to grow. Um, the the other uh, very common reason people decide to test their soil is to is to check for um, contamination. Um, the, the the list of potentially harmful elements that can be lurking in the soil is, is as I said before, as long as my arm, and, and that's that's no exaggeration. I, I I actually have rather long arms, and still much longer than my arm. The the basic ones, as I said, we look for we look for heavy metals, lead, cadmium, mercury, various hydrocarbons, and asbestos. Um, the most common sources of these are um, are, are a history of industry, really. Um, this is, of course, rather more common in our urban centers. Um, and and the, the key thing here to remember is that proximity to heavy traffic areas where airborne pollutants um, are present from um, you know, any, anything from, from a car exhaust to um, industry um, factory stack, these exhausts can settle on the soil and remain there um, almost indefinitely. Um, countryside areas are, are are also not necessarily exempt. Um, think about the um, the historic mining operations scattered around um, around the UK. Um, they they may also be responsible for having left behind a, a toxic legacy. There's there's an awful lot of um, copper, nickel, etc. that that are that is left over from the tailings from the mine, mining operations, even if they've long been closed. Beyond that, there are, there are a couple other things to to remember. Um, it's also possible that um, Pathogens, um, E. coli and salmonella, are sometimes present. Well, are present in sewage, and and uh, when when areas are flooded, if our if our mains overflow and the sewage water contains, uh, sorry, the, the flood water contains some sewage, then um, then some of these pathogen pathogens can end up in our in our soil. That then, of course, we have to be very very careful. Um, make sure that we, we 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 wash our produce in our hands very very carefully after after spending time in the garden. So there is one more um, there is one, one more reason that one may want to test. Of course, is um, if you are near um, a farming area or a, an area that has a legacy of farming, um, then it is possible that pesticides and herbicides that were once used in um, the operation of the farm can linger. Um, often things that we used to use as pesticides and herbicides 50, well, actually as recently as 10, 20 years ago, um, have, have since been deemed unsafe. Um, and the legacy can, can remain in the soil for very, very long periods of time. Any, any of those or all of those or a combination of those is, uh, is what, what, what prompts uh, many people to, to have a look. Yeah. So I was thinking when you were talking about new build houses, um, you know, is, is building work a concern as well, especially where building materials might have been incorporated into the soil? So um, less so today than, than, they, than they used to be. Um, so historically, um, 
historically building materials used to include, of course, as best as we know about um, paint, uh, lead, lead, and uh, sorry, we used paint uh, containing lead quite often as well. So, so chippings from that would end up in the soil. All those, all those sort of historical things, and we know in in, in new builds, you sort of hear the um, you hear the stories when someone digs down in the garden and they find all sort of. Uh, construction leftovers just just beneath the surface, you know, bricks and and bits of this and that. Um, these days, that's uh, that's less of a problem than it was. But if it's historical uh, building product, then then it may very well be um, something that has some 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 paint, some old paint with lead in it, perhaps asbestos, um, and a few other sort of sort of nasty bits. Um, this this really comes into its own when we talk about um, development on brownfield sites. I mean, it very much depends. One brownfield site is very very different from another. But these are these are areas where where the the current government in Westminster is is very much focused on getting the the country going uh, by building more and more houses. And brownfield sites are the are the focus for them. And indeed, the idea of um, of ensuring quicker planning permission to get things built. Is um, is going to be driving that over the next few years. Um, now, council uh, councils uh, tend to request that developers carry out a survey that ensure that a site is safe um, and free contamination. But if 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 you have brownfield sites near you and your house has been there for a while, it may be something that you're you may want to check uh, to look into as well. Because I mean, the idea that a, a brownfield site has a um, has a boundary is a rather ridiculous one because things can leach and can move around and whether they're airborne things that, that, that travel in the wind or, or deeper down water table uh, moves things around as well as, as animals and, and people um, can spread things around. So being in proximity to a brownfield site is, is, is another reason that people sometimes decide that they'd rather check and be, be safe rather than take any unnecessary chances. Is the main concern when people are growing food crops or is it a case of just being near the soil itself that where contamination or, or other things could become an issue well it's a it's a little bit of um, it's a little bit of everything the food crops are tricky because actually let's let's step back if you think about um, if you think about soil contamination there are there are three ways that things can um, can cause problems for us there are three ways rather that they, they can cause problems for us so contamination in soil we can we can absorb it um, dermally so through contact with, uh, with our skin we can um, breathe in airborne um, uh, elements, um, and we can ingest things. And the, the last one, the ingestion, is where the question about whether growing veg- fruit and vegetables is, is is the most is the trickiest one. And, and I guess in that respect, it is because that third that third pathway is then open when you're doing when you're growing those things. Um, there are two things there. There is we're talking about bits of soil left on the on the produce we grow, and then eating those, which is why it's always important to to wash your wash your produce very very carefully, regardless of whether you grew it at home or bought it in the supermarket. Really, um, and the, the 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 other way is that that some contaminants, lead for example, um, can be taken up by the things we grow. Now, in that case, it's um, if you know that you have elevated levels of lead in your soil. Um, and you're growing fruit or veg, uh, particularly with root vegetables, for example, be, beware of the fact that root vegetables can take up the lead, and the, the lead can be inside the vegetable itself, so carrots, parsnips, things like that. Whereas, um, again, it all sort of depends on the on the, on the levels of, of, the, of the of the contamination in the soil. But it's, uh, other produce, tomatoes, peppers, for example, don't do take up a whole lot less of the of the lead. So, provided you wash those carefully, we should be fine. But again, it depends very much on the level. Um, and the tricky thing is that there isn't really a red line. So if you look at um, various guidelines around the world in the UK, we, we have a, a, a guideline of, say, for allotments, it's um, 80 parts per million, uh, 80 milligrams per kilogram. Um, whereas in, um, in, in other growing spaces, uh, that can go up to as high as 200, 300, or 400. We've seen findings in the thousands. Um, indeed, there was a study done recently in... Um, in Newcastle, where um, some of the allotments there, uh, city centre allotments in Newcastle, had elevated levels of lead, and um, there was a study done by Newcastle University looking into this and suggested that maybe this isn't as much of a problem as we first thought, and that when they when they looked at the individuals using the allotments, the levels of lead in their bloodstreams were not as elevated as they would have thought, 
um, compared to, to those who are not uh, taking part in the allotments. Now, there is an awful lot within that that, you, that needs to be followed up, but nevertheless, basic, basic principles like washing your produce, washing your hands, um, perhaps wearing gloves if you, if you know that your soil is, uh, has elevated levels of something like this, something like lead, are all very, very good, good um, best practice um, things to follow. Yeah. So if we were to get a soil test done, um, I think sometimes they are a bit uh, indecipherable uh, when the results come through. Um, <laughs> yes. When, for example, with your soil tests, it, it, do you just kind of give a reading as to what is in the soil? And then, like you say, it's it's on the onus is on the recipient of the test to kind of say, OK, well, I'm going to now go away and look at whether that's acceptable or not. Or do you send out kind of explanatory notes with them? So this is this is very much um, this is very much the key. And indeed, when we when we started out, this was one of the frustrations we we faced. Um, this all started um, a long long time ago with um, uh, with with a little experience I uh, I had here in um, in my own house in my own garden where I have. Um, I have always enjoyed growing um, growing vegetables. It, it, it's a long-standing um, infatuation I have that you can stick a seed in the ground and watch it grow, and eventually it fruits or, or and, and become something you can eat. It's just the most amazing thing. And I, I, I regularly do this, and in the back garden we um, we regularly grow things. And I was chatting with a um, with a neighbor here who um, who mentioned to me that um, you know there was a um, this was a conversation in passing. You mentioned that there was some industry here, um, not very far away from the from the house. And I thought, well, that's um, it was a, a battery factory actually. And I, I thought this is um, that doesn't sound terribly um, eco friendly, if you will. So I, I decided to look into into the testing soil, and this this proved to be quite a faff. And and the, the question you ask about the, the report. So yes, of course, we, we will provide the the results and all the readings, but we also provide a report that. That tries to interpret these. There are UK safe for use levels for many of these things, but not all. Um, but we we list those for for all of the all of the things we test for. And where, where there are no UK um, levels available or none that are, that have been published, we look further afield. Whether that's um, whether that's uh, Canada or the EU or the US, we look at all of those. We provide a listing of those and, and give you an idea of what the acceptable levels are around the world. Um, and you can make up your own mind. We sort of use a, a color code to, to, to give you an idea where, where, where your attention should be focused. So, you know, green is fine. Um, orange is maybe maybe worth a second look. And red is um, stop what you're doing and, and think twice. So it's 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 very much a key. The interpretation of these results is very much a big a big part of what we do. Um, because, as you say, the, the reports in themselves are incomprehensible. It's a series of numbers. Um, it's hard to figure out even what what the what the what the unit you used even mean. So. Very much, uh, the interpretation is key. Yeah, I sounded like that question. I, I, I planted that in there to make you sound good, but I didn't genuinely didn't know if that that's what you did. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's really good because um, yeah, they are. That I've looked into getting them done before, and and it, they're just a nightmare to be honest with you. It's like I can have it done, but then what am I meant to do with that information? It, it that actually means nothing to me. So so that is a bit of a revelation there. Precisely, precisely. And fertility is the same thing. You know that our our our, our testing cli- our, our testing customers are. Roughly half uh, half are interested in the fertility of the soil, and half are interested in the contamination of the soil. There's actually a small, not quite half and half, maybe 45 45 percent, and then the other 10 percent are interested in both. Um, and the, on the fertility side, it's the same thing. It's a, you can you can look at a relatively simple set of results that gives you your pH, gives you your um, your uh, organic uh, content matter, um, your um, the th- three major um, soil nutrients: magnesium, potassium, uh, phosphorus, and 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 also a, um, a description of the soil texture, you know, sandy soil, clay soil, heavy, light, whatever. And then what? It's the it's a very very similar thing. We we talk about some of these things, but when you look at the whole picture, it becomes very very difficult to get your head around what what they actually mean. Um, so again, the, the reports aim to to provide some sort of a context and and sort of a best practice, depending on what what it is you want to grow. Um, and that's another thing to consider because on the fertility side, sorry, I'm rambling a little bit, but I'll just, I'll just get this, get this one point in. On the fertility side, it's not always about trying to change the pH reading so that it fits whatever it, whatever it is you're doing. It, it may sometimes make sense if you have acidic soil to alter the things you're trying to grow. 
So if you happen to have acidic soil in your garden, um, why not why not grow you know, uh, blueberries or fruits and things like that that tend to thrive in that rather than than saying oh I need to change the pH because I'm trying to grow something entirely different. Um, we've we've in our in in the in the results we we've, we've seen we've, we've come across um, spectacularly offbeat pH readings with um, <laughs> with soils that are that that can in some cases are extremely acidic or indeed alkaline and we know that you know most plants prefer uh, oddly neutral soil conditions, um, so a pH of around seven. But adapting what it is you're trying to grow to the conditions rather than always trying to change the soil to, to suit you is yet another thing to consider. So, you know, meeting some, somewhere in the middle is probably, probably ideal. Mm, definitely. Yeah. Um, it, I think probably I didn't actually stick that closely to the questions that I sent you beforehand. So I'm just, I'm going completely off topic, but, um, this is, <laughs> I think my last question that I'll ask you. Um, and that is, I was thinking when you were speaking, do, do we need to have a test done more than more than once? Because I'm I'm also thinking about the things that we could add to our soils, such as um, green waste uh, or manure that's mm-hmm. come from, or, or product that's come from green waste. And I I'm guessing that's not routinely tested. So it could be that we kind of start off at one point, but then we add other things into our soils, and we might need to have the test done again. Is that the case? Very much so, um, particularly on the um, on the fertility side. So um, soil soil pH can can shift from from year to year. Um, and if you're you know if you're if you're if you're liming the soil um, or if you're uh, adding sulfur to it, trying to again change the pH, whether or not it's actually taken, it, it's it's a it's a chemical reaction. It doesn't it doesn't happen overnight. Just simply adding something to it doesn't doesn't mean that presto it's done. The, the reaction has to take place. The, the amount you've, you've added has to, has to be broadly in line with how much you needed to, to make, how much of a change you needed to make. Um, and then you need to, you, well, you don't need to, but uh, chances are you're, you'd be better off to, to know, to know what, what the things, what the various things you've done have actually, what kind of an effect they've actually had on the, on the soil. Um, we, we know that, 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 um, you know, we can add we can add nutrients that are in short supply. Um, again, if it's very sandy soil, they, they can often just leach out and, and be, be gone within six months. So you, we should probably that that treatment should probably include adding a lot of organic matter, whether it's manure or some, or some or compost of some other kind, um, that will help help retain some of the, some of those nutrients. Um, we, as, as we said already, we can we can adjust the pH by adding lime. We can increase it. But sorry, by adding lime to increase it, or we can add sulfur to lower it. Um, some of us who are a little bit older may remember um, using uh, using peat for that. Indeed, some of us used to swear by it, but that's um, that's no longer a thing. Um, uh, we can um, we can we can even attempt to make extremely heavy clay, uh, clay soils um, workable by adding by adding some of that organic matter. But then, once it way through, you want to see what the what the effect of the things you've done. Is um, particularly if you're trying to grow things that are sensitive to to very small pH differences. So, and again, and 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 adding some of these elements too close to the growing season, they 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 may actually hurt the plants you're you're growing if the if the seedlings are in the are in the area when you're actually putting some of these things down. So you want to you want to plan a little bit further in advance. Um, there's one more thing, which is um, a bit of an aside. It, it's not it's not really an issue, but it, it has come up in that in that manure, of course, can um, can carry um, can carry some of the some of the pathogens. So one one needs to be careful the the, the E. coli and etc. That, that can be present. Um, and furthermore, it depends very much on where the um, where the pasture, what's on the pasture land. So if there are pesticides or herbicides present, that can sometimes show up in manure at, at the point where you're using the manure. Some of those pesticide and herbicide elements can remain and, and be passed on in manure onto your garden. So it's all part of a sort of a circular pattern. We follow you know, that the, the manure comes from an animal that that, that was um, that lived on, on pasture that may have had some of these things in it. It will pass it on. It'll end up in your garden. And you'll think that you've been you've been uh, growing in the most organic manner possible, and yet can end up with some of these things affecting some of the the, the the crops you're trying to help. So, just something to keep in mind. Thank you to Robert for speaking about this really important topic. 
I'd love to hear from you if you've had a soil test done or if you're thinking about it and whether you found the process easy in the past. Thank you for listening. Now here's Dr Ian Bedford talking about the sort of bugs we might be getting more familiar with as we turn our attention from outdoor flowers to indoor ones. There's never a time of year when gardening has to stop. Although the motivation to venture outside on a cold, damp and overcast winter's day might be lacking a little for some of us. So why not use this time of year to focus on any indoor plants that might have been neglected over the warmer months? Besides a bit of pruning, repotting and feeding, it's a perfect time to check for infestations of hemipteran insects. The sapsuckers, which are the most common group of delicate indoor plant pests, and include species of aphids, whitefly, mealybugs and scale insects. Sapsucking pests can cause serious problems to tender plants as they siphon out the phloem and progressively weaken the plant. Left untreated, they can build up large populations and will readily spread to other plants around the house. Despite large infestations, some of these sap suckers are not easily seen whilst they feed motionlessly on the undersides of leaves or along the stems. However, there's often a telltale sign when a plant is infested which provides us with the opportunity to deal with it. And this sign is the presence of little sticky droplets on the upper surfaces of lower leaves and on the table or floor below the plant pot. These sticky droplets are the excess sugars that the insects excrete whilst they feed, commonly known as honeydew and often contaminated with a black sooty mould. Once detected, the simplest and safest way to control the infestation is by using a proprietary soap-based plant protection product that not only removes the sap suckers by a non-toxic physical means, but also washes away the honeydew and the moulds. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk follow me on twitter roots and all facebook roots and all uk and instagram roots and all pod but please also check out my patreon where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work because if you like what i do please help me to continue doing it even if you make a one-off donation of a pound trust me it all helps and i will be immensely grateful so please go to patreon and search for roots and all